Exodus chapter 17, you follow along as I begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. And therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. The people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take your sons and elders of Israel and take in your hand your rod with you which you struck the river and go. Behold, I stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Verse number eight. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for the truth of the word of God. Lord, that what we just sang about what we believe is, Lord, more than just a church slogan. It's so much more than just what is connected to the name on a sign. Father, these are the cores that give us hope, the truth of who you are. And Lord, today, that is the foundation of what we will look at when we find ourselves hitting obstacles that just don't seem to make sense. I pray, Father, you do a great working in our heart. Give me the words to say that only you want to be said. I pray, Father, you will speak where I cannot. And, Lord, meet the needs of those who are here and those that are watching today. We love you, Father. We're grateful for the privilege to study your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. In the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about this idea of being all in, making an impacting kingdom work. And we made a comment that we were going to be very intentional about encouraging you to engage in kingdom work. And so we talked a couple weeks at the Strong Roots. What does it look like? Last week we talked about taking it personally. Uh, I won't repeat those. If you're interested, you can go to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. You can go back and watch those as they're live streamed. And, and then Sparky does a great job of putting it all into a playlist on YouTube. So as they're added, it'll, you'll just see just the messages from each series. And, but one of the, this, today I want to talk about the idea of what happens when you hit obstacles. Overcoming obstacles obstacles. Now, I'm going to say something that's not always the greatest selling point. And one of the things that's true when you serve God, I, one of the things that's great about serving God is you see God do great miracles. You see God move mountains. You see God use you in a way that you thought he never could. You also get to see Satan in a way that you thought you never would. How many of you ever experienced that before? Obstacles while serving. I won't ask how many of you are doing it right now. You're the ones too tired to pick your hands up, right? When, they, there, years ago, I had someone ask me, and I, I thought this at one point. I've heard people preach this. I've heard people say, someone came and said, I follow God. I do what I believe is right. Why is everything so hard? And they had get, been given this idea that if they dedicate their life to Christ and they serve the Lord and they really just commit that God will eliminate the problems and God will just make life so much easier and it's a selling point you see that a lot in what's known as prosperity gospel that if you're right with God and serving right God's going to bless you God's going to give you money God's going to give you this and by the way God may bless you God may allow you to have more money but that doesn't mean that there won't be some battles in the process as a matter of fact Peter is speaking to the church in first Peter 4 this is what Peter says. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake, that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Peter tells the church, do not think it strange when you find yourself in a fiery trial. When it seems like everything's falling apart, nothing seems fair. And by the way, things might be falling apart. It might not be fair. 
And God is allowed for whatever reason. We'll talk later about why would he do that. How do I grow? What can I learn? Now, let me explain what I want us to get today. All right? This is not another 30 minutes of feeling bad. All right? This is not like why life is miserable. I think we need to understand that serving God is not always the easiest path. Can I tell you, I've met people who don't serve God. It's not a whole lot easier. Right now, you know, life's hard. Right? Life is complicated in just about a million ways, and it just gets harder. You know, you know, politics makes it easy, doesn't it? Aren't you glad that the politicians have all the answers? They do. It changes tomorrow, but they have the answers, all right? That's okay. Aren't you glad your hope's not in the White House? Amen. Somebody's laughed. That was the perfect answer, all right? Aren't we? Because here's the thing. While what decisions are made affect us, the ultimate hope is in Jesus Christ. Then how do, what do we do when we find ourselves in the middle of an obstacle? It seems like God's brought. We're serving. We're doing right. We've given. We're, we're, we're giving. We're involved. We're doing all the things that God has asked us to do. We're in obedience to God. And then God allows an obstacle. Catch what I said. God allows an obstacle. And it just doesn't make sense. Now, by the way, when it doesn't make sense, that's actually a good thing. Because if God's allowing you into your life, he's trying to teach you something. So don't be surprised when sometimes it just doesn't make sense. So how do we handle these obstacles? What can we learn from times during this? What I'm going to do is we're going to walk through the story we just read and the next one and break, uh, unpack it a little bit and talk a little bit about the children of Israel. We talked a little bit about this last week with the children of Israel. Last week we talked how they would kind of come to the end of this journey of wandering through the wilderness. Well, at this point, they're in the middle of this journey. And one thing you're going to find out about the children of Israel, you're going to find out because you might relate with this. There's a phrase that's used, depending what translation you use. I grew up in the old King James, and so we would hear the phrase that the children of Israel murmured. I remember in college, he would just murmur. They were the biggest complainers in the history of the world, all right? No matter what God give them, they complain more. None of us do that. You know, we're Americans. We don't complain about anything. All right? So I know you won't find any correlation in that. But just in case you do, let's look into this. So what we'll do is we're going to give three principles and then unpack some of the scripture. Uh, the first principle is simply this. God's work does not depend on my spiritual strength. God's work does not depend on my spiritual strength. Now, I won't reread the first seven verses, but let me unpack a little bit about what's going on here. All right. So the congregation of Israel, they're out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to following God, and they get thirsty. Now, please understand, they're in the desert, the wilderness. There's not, you know, they're in between. There's not a lot of water available. And so they find themselves in a legitimate problem. There's no water. What do we do? Now, you know what they do? They begin to complain to Moses. Because, of course, this is Moses' fault. And so they complain to him. And they whine. And they say, what are you going to do? In fact, at one point in this passage, Moses goes to God and said, I think they're going to stone me. And I wonder if he's thinking, that might be better than dealing with them. You ever been in that spot? And so they're, they're griping. Now, please understand, God has always provided. God was always going to provide. But yet somehow, before God provided, the, the people just want to make a point to let God know we're not happy about what's going on. Now, in this process, God goes, uh, Moses goes to God, and God gives Moses a specific list of instructions of what I want you to do. Because I want you to take the staff, I want you to take some elders, and I want you to go to this rock, and I want you to hit it. And we'll talk in a minute about some of the significance behind this. He hits the rock, and water pours out. And you understand, there are millions of people, livestock. This wasn't a trinkle. I mean, God was able to take care of all of that water coming out of a place where it should not have come out of. You know, God didn't have to. You know what God doesn't have to provide? It's in his character because he does. But sometimes in our life, sometimes in serving the Lord, if we're not careful, we can get with this, this idea that God is blessing me because I'm spiritual or God is not blessing me because I'm just not really spiritual this week. And you know what I mean by spiritual? All right? I haven't read my Bible as much this week. I haven't been as kind as I should be. The fruits of the Spirit not really been my strength in this last week. And we think because of that, well, maybe that's why I'm missing out on blessing. Maybe that's why, and we can do that. And I, 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 there was a time in my life growing up, that's exactly how I felt. 
that God, I can't expect God to bless me until I'm at this point. In fact, Bible says you have not because you ask not. Well, obviously I'm not praying enough. And that can happen. And please understand something. I want to clarify one thing because you can go too far what I'm saying. God's plan is not you to sit back, do nothing, and God blesses. I hope you understand that. I do believe that we do the possible, God does the impossible. We need to do our part. But what God wants to do in your life and through your life is not fully dependent upon you because he's going to grow you through it. Let me give you an example. As parents, have you ever felt like you failed? I won't ask any parent to raise their hand because every parent would have to. I said this a while ago. You remember when they were babies and you couldn't wait till they were toddlers and they could walk? You thought it would be easier? And that thought continued until they became an adult. You thought it'll be easier when they're 23 and on their own. And you notice it just doesn't get easier, right? Now, so as parents, sometimes we come to an end of a situation, end of a week, and we're like, Lord, how did I take something that bad and made it even worse? And that's how we feel. God, you gave these kids the worst parent in the world. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. You say, I don't say that at church. No, we say that in, a, before, in a sleep at, work, at night when we can't sleep. You see, you feel like I failed. And you know, sometimes we do. But you know one of the things you can hold on to? God's work is not limited to whether I failed or did not fail that week. God can use me even when I totally and completely mess up. God can use you when you feel inadequate, when you feel like what you're trying to do just is not good enough. And maybe you haven't, your God hasn't developed that talent in you enough and you feel under-equipped. God can still use you. A couple quick things under this. We do see the condition of the people. We see a great miracle in this passage, but we see a great problem with the people. The children of Israel are wandering the wilderness, were often complaining about what they didn't have. There are even times that when it was stated, they would say, it'd be better if we were back in slavery. This is the one thing that's always intrigued me about listening to when people complain. You ever notice when you complain, your reaction becomes illogical, irrational? Silly, I won't say other words. I'm trying to be nice here. Okay, you ever done that? You know, so here's what they're saying. Please understand, when they were in slavery, they were making bricks. They're walking through my making bricks. They're eating the worst diet known to man. Moses takes them out through God's power. They're leaving. God is providing manna. God's taking care of them. And what does sometimes they do when they complain? It'd just be better if we were in slavery. You know, sometimes when God's doing a work in our life, and we say it's not fair. We look back to what it used to be like and say, God, it would have just been easier if you left me there. Because when we're walking through a journey, walking through a journey is not always easy. So a couple weeks ago, my family and I went to uh, Bass Lake and we were ultimately going to go to Yosemite. But in Bass Lake, we took a hike. Uh, most of the younger age called it a walk. My wife and I called it a hike. All right. Because there's one spot that was straight up. And so we're walking up. I think Angel Falls. We're walking up it. And it's just a couple spots. It was absolutely beautiful. But about a little way, my children are in better shape than me. I'll just put it that way, okay? And so, you know, they're just jotting up this thing like it's no big deal. And I'm thinking, give me a rope because this is getting steeper. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's the premise. I'm like, I'm not in shape like I used to be, right? So as we're getting there, it's getting tiring. Now, we've, yeah, we've done other real hikes, not like that, but real hikes, where you do. You notice how you, it's beautiful what you can see, but then you got to keep going up. And then you get older, the young people run around you like you're an idiot. Uh, years ago, this happened. We were in uh, Zacatecas, Mexico, which I don't know the details, but I remember it's one of the higher points. And I just could we were there for a mission, mission trip, and I just couldn't get over the elevation. So we're walking these stairs to the top of the mountain for sightseeing. And I remember, because I'm carrying, I don't remember if it was Nathan, it was Caleb. I was carrying Caleb on my back, and he was six months old or what, eight months old, whatever it was. I don't remember how old he was. And uh, so we're walking up, and I was having a hard time breathing. And every once in a while, the six of us adults would just sit down on one of the steps. And literally, the kids we brought on the trip would walk around us in circles making fun of us. They'd just, come on, come on, get up. And then we got up there, and I finally asked the missionary. And I'm like, how much would it have cost to take the trolley up here? He goes, oh, $2 a person. I'm like, what? Missionaries lead cheap. I, I, cheap. I'm a preacher. I'm not that cheap. We could have taken the trolley. I would have paid for it. Now, when you go in those paths, like this kind of hike or whatever, it seems complicated. But just like the other day at Angel Falls, you know what happens when you get to the top? It's gorgeous. All of the work to get there 
You know what? I take this hike again. Once you can start breathing, I'll take that hike again. In our journey, what God's doing, it's easy for us to say, if I could just go back. And by the way, it is easier to stay at the bottom and not always go through the battles, not go through the conflict. But then are we learning what God's trying to teach us? Are we becoming who God's trying to develop us to be if we just stay there? The people did not deserve God's blessing, especially with their attitude, but that didn't change God's response. While we should be growing in the Lord, we do not have to be perfect to be used of God. So let me look at number two, the provision of the Lord. The provision of the Lord, God's willingness to provide for a sinful people is a reminder that God's grace is greater than our sin, than even when we get into our carnal condition, because his provision is based on his character. God's work, or God works because God is good, and God can even get glory when I am not at my best and I do not deserve what he's giving. That is what literally is called the grace of God. Let's look at a couple things about this miracle where he, he, he brings water from the stone. So Moses hits the rock with the staff. Interesting, it's the same staff used to part the Red Sea and to defeat the army. It's the same staff we'll talk about in a minute that was used in the middle of a war. So it was something that God had used as a picture. And it was a picture to let people know that Moses wasn't doing this, that God had chosen to use that, and this is a proof. It was God doing this. So he used the staff to remind people Moses is not doing this, God is. It was another reminder that God was engaged, I was there, he was providing. He had the elders there as a united sign that this was from God, the leadership was participating, God was the one providing. But one of the unique parts of the story is the rock. Because later on, this story happens in a similar way again. They've complained about water, and Moses hits the rock. Now, there's a lot of debate over what happened, but the interesting part was he was told to speak to the rock the second time. Water came out. Why? Because the picture of the rock is the picture of Christ, where life has come out of it. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so there is pictures in the Old Testament that point to Jesus. And we see these pictures, and we see what Jesus is doing. It's another reminder, as we look back to the Old Testament, that we can see the Trinity, we can see all parts of what God is doing, but God's provision to us is based on his character. Not always on us. Now again, I will say this. If you're looking for work, and you say, I'm going to sit home and click through old TV shows and not put an application in, God won't bless that. I hope we understand there's that balance there. But when we are doing what God's asked us to do, don't allow what is going to be a weakness to stop us from moving forward. If you desire to be all in, it does not require that you are perfect. It just requires that you are willing and that you are teachable. Then principle two, God's work will always be met with adversity. So let's go. Now we just get done and we get done with, you know, you can talk about Israel, you can talk about the miracle. God has proven himself over the power of physical nature by bringing water from a rock. God has proven his power. God has shown his character and God has shown the children of Israel, we love you. I can take care of you. Man, that's exciting. You know, God has answered a prayer. God has moved. God has provided. God has done a great thing. Man, this is absolutely exciting. Let's go to the next verse. Now Amalek, Amalek came and fought with Israel. And Rephidim. Do you ever feel like the moment you think you're out of it, it just gets worse? That's exactly what's happening here. Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So literally, shortly after the water problem was solved, another problem came along in the name of Amalek. Now, who is Amalek? Who are the Amalekites? Interestingly enough, the Amalekites are actually the descendants of Esau. Jacob's brother. Now, if you know Jacob's name, which changed to Israel, that's why we call them the uh, children of Israel. Jacob's children. The 12 tribes are from the children of Israel, Jacob's descendants. Esau's descendants were the Amalekites. So basically, a really extensive struggle of sibling rivalry. It's a little more detailed than that, but that's a basic way. And they were going to be one of the constant enemies of Israel. So what do we see about this? One, there was a conflict after a great miracle. In this battle, they come. They come in, and it's another situation where it seems like we're getting out of this, and here comes more conflict. So there was conflict after a great miracle. Please understand, with serving the Lord and walking with Christ, don't be surprised that Satan works the same time 
God is working. So let me give you an example. You ever heard of the phrase that sometimes we use in church? Preachers, evangelists use it a lot. They call it mountaintop experiences. All right? So like we talk about the hike. You get to the top of the mountain. It's like it was worth it. You can see everything. It was beautiful. When we got to the top of Angels Falls, I'd never been there. Didn't realize, you know, there's places of swimming, all kinds of things. And we're getting ready to leave. As we're getting ready to leave, please understand, if you're new to our church, I'm new to California. I'm 16 months here. I moved from the Northeast. So this next phrase is not something I'm used to hearing. So as we're leaving, a guy comes up to us. He goes, I wouldn't go down that path. I just saw a bear. And all the other people, Cool. And I'm like, this is, a, this is the Lord telling us to get off the mountain, right? We need to leave. He saw a bear. And I didn't think that the other kids, you know, skinny kids jumping into the water were going to chase off the bear. The only point I had was there were kids still in the water. All I had to do was beat them down the mountain. You know that old phrase, right? My son, my youngest, looks at me. He goes, Dad, don't worry. I cannot run you. And I said, I just got to trip you. What are you talking about? Problem solved. Trip you and I win. I'm not. What are you talking about? It's good parenting, isn't it? You're all like, what kind of dad would say that? And I actually did say that. I don't think I would. I've never been chased by a bear, so I can't prove that. But I don't think I would. (laughs) Anyway, when we got there, we're like, it's beautiful. And then all of a sudden, time to go down. Now, I didn't ask him how far the bear had been. I didn't ask him if it was brown or black. He said bear. It could have been a bear cub. It could have been a teddy bear someone put there. And I'm getting off the mountain. All right? It's kind of like other places. Oh, be careful. There's snakes over there. We're walking up the mountain, and we saw snake holes, and then there was one. We came down. The thing had to be a foot round. And I'm like, what kind of snake's coming out of that? I don't guess it's a snake. But it's where, you know, you're walking through, you can see all of the potential. But you know when you get top of the mountain, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. All of these crazy things in life, all of the things that Satan does to fight, seem to be okay at the top. Because you've won. You begin to see the fruit. You begin to see the victories. You begin to see God bless. You begin to see when you win, these battles you've been fighting for weeks or months. You see the end of it, and it's exciting. And you're like, Lord, this is great. Thank you. And then you go back down off the mountain enjoying the blessings of God. I answered prayer, provision, healing, new jobs, whatever it is that God's bringing in your life. Someone in your ministry getting saved. You being able to connect with somebody. And you're excited about this. And then you go back down off the mountain. And guess who's at the bottom of the mountain? Satan. Trying to discourage you. Is it worth it? Can I tell you? Yes, absolutely it's worth it. I will say this though. You know, I I don't know much about farming. I can ask Keith later. He can answer some of these questions. But my guess, if I'm not right, it takes longer to plant than it does to harvest. Am I right on that one? Sure. Okay. (laughs) Depending who's working the fields, right? (laughs) I hope I... Here's my premise. Sometimes when we're serving, you know, reaping into the ministry, it seems like I reap and I reap and I do and I obey and it just seems like nothing's happening. There's reasons, seasons of reaping. There's also seasons of sowing. God will bless. God will bring fruit. God will answer prayer if we stay at it and keep going. God, God allows us to have these times and enjoy these victories or else sometimes our work would feel pointless. We cannot be confused when Satan is there when we come down. God is still greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. The second thought is conflict is not always a bad thing. See, wait a minute. How is conflict not always a bad thing? So what can we learn from conflict? God is always good, and God is stronger than my struggle. God rarely works the way that I think he will. This is where I learn more about God. Please understand that's a good thing. We look at conflict. You know, sometimes what we do is look at conflict and say, Lord, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And God's like, no, it's here for you. A third thought is God is growing me and making me stronger So I should get careful not to walk away from the process. We see this in James 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This conflict might be exactly that. Here's the phrase I want us to focus on. Let patience have its perfect work. That word let is an imperative. It's a command. God is saying, let it go. Let the development of your patience keep going. God is trying to teach you patience. God is trying to mature you. God is trying to strengthen you. So that way, when you're, whatever is coming next, you're ready for it. 
But if every time things get complicated and we look at a mountain, we say, no, I'm out of shape. I can't do that. And we walk away. We miss what God is trying to do in our life. Parents, things are going to come your way. You think it's overwhelming. And God brought it to you to teach you so that you can better equip your family for that. If you're serving in a ministry, God's going to bring maybe obstacles or really opportunities to teach you so that you can invest what you're learning into the life of other people, even in areas of grief. Second Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, it is for your consolation and salvation that we have gone through this grief so that we can be better at helping you. Even in grief, God can use these things to develop us. So our responsibility is to stay in it. Our responsibility is not to run away. Our responsibility is not to say it's not fair. And sometimes it is completely not fair. But God will work through that to develop a Christ-like version in our life. Number three, and then we'll be done. God's work done in, in God's strength will have God's blessings. God's work done in God's strength will have God's blessing. Verse number 9. Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. God's work done and God's strength will have God's blessing. So please understand, Moses sends Joshua to battle. He goes to the top of the hill using the same staff that parted the Red Sea and that brought water from the rock. We're seeing God in action. I read this about the staff from one commentator this week. He said, the staff was a sign of God's power and presence. And so it would be lifted up before the people as a reminder that God would fight for them against their enemies. The lifted rod served to bolster the faith and encourage the fearful hearts of Israel as they warred against the Amalekites. When we know that God is with us and that by his power we are saved, our faith is strengthened and the battle will go our way. A couple quick principles and then we'll be done. The battle was won by God, not by man. When we go all in and Satan brings an obstacle or God allows an obstacle, the battle is fought by God, not by me. What do I do? I stay with it. I keep going. I stay faithful where God has me and I stay there until God steps in. Let me give you, I was listening to a podcast this week from a preacher and he made a good point. It goes back to the story of when Peter walked on the water. The part that he was mentioning is something that I'd seen before but forgotten. We all know that they were in the storm. Jesus walked in the water. If you know the story, they were afraid. There's a lot of great principles. But here's an interesting principle. They talk about the time of the day that Jesus walked in the water. There's a chance that the disciples had been roaring, rowing, excuse me, that's the wrong <laughs> word, but rowing on the water for eight to ten hours in the middle of a horrendous storm. So realize how tired they are. Realize how hard this would be. God waited. Until the end, the darkest part of the day, really, waited to the end, and they were tired. And you know the principle that this guy brought out that was so powerful? Sometimes you feel like you're working, you're working, you're working, and where is God? He's still coming, so what do I do in that time? Just keep rowing until God comes. God ultimately just eliminated the storm. But in that time, just keep rowing. Just keep going. What do I do? Just obey whatever the last thing God told me to do. And stay in obedience there. These men had to go and fight something they had become accustomed to, but they knew God would go with them. Please remember, whatever you may face, must, you must remember blessings come from obedience. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 Samuel 15, 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. So yes, while we let God do it, we live in obedience, and we step out. Number two, God's plan required more than one person. So Joshua goes to battle, he does his part. Moses goes to the top of the hill, he does his part. 
But it's interesting in the story. And I've heard a lot of people talk about this idea of his hands being held up and people say, helping hold up the hands of other people. There's a lot of great truth behind this. So Moses gets up there, picks up his hands, and as he's doing it, they're winning. And then his hands get tired. He's not the youngest guy there. And doing that for a long period of time is tiring anyway. And then as his hands go down, all of a sudden, Amalek begins to win. The Amalekites win. So his brother and sister say, what are we going to do? They give him somewhere to sit. And they stand there and they hold his hands up. And the principle is that even though God used Moses' hands risen to help defeat the enemy, Moses needed help in doing that. One of the great principles you're going to realize, if you get all in and you serve and you follow God, you can't do it alone. God never intended you to do it alone. Can I tell you why Satan wants you to feel like you got to do it alone? Because the more alone you are, the harder it is to keep going forward. The more alone you are, the easier it is to hear the lies in your mind that you tell yourself or that Satan tells you. The more you begin to think you can't do it, that you're going to fail. That's why when we challenge here at church to be engaged, to be engaged, be in an adult Bible study, be around people, join a small group, join a team, because you're doing life together. Satan wants you alone. Satan wants you alone because whether you know it or not, when you're alone, it is where you are at your weakest point. Now, if you're like some, if you're an introvert, you say, being alone is my happy place. You know, being alone, I'm glad. I don't have to pretend like that was a funny joke. I don't have to pretend like any of that. I, this week I was watching a guy I follow online, and he, uh, he's a greeter at his church. And uh, so he was stretching in front of his church. And he's like, today is my day to ruin the day of all introverts. I mean, he was excited about that, right? Go out and make all the introverts uncomfortable as I go out there. That's not the job of a greeter, but you know the premise. But Satan wants us alone because alone is where we're weakest. God has got a plan for you to be surrounded by people because when you're surrounded by people, there's accountability, there's encouragement, there's strength. God never intended you to do this alone. That's why we challenge you to get all, when you get all in, get on a team, get engaged in a small group. In a couple weeks for that breakfast, show up. We're not going to make sign up for anything that day. Just learn. Learn what's available that is set up, designed for this purpose so that you don't have to be alone. That's where Satan wants you. That's where you're vulnerable and you're around other people. That's where you find strength. In serving, I mean, it's safer when people serve together anyway, just for logistics. But it's better in general. Because you know what you can learn from someone else? That's what we said last week. What a, what a great opportunity to take someone young with this great vision, with somebody experienced, with great wisdom, and put them together. That's the premise behind it. Of what, how, what can be accomplished when they take their strengths and they move forward with it? How can we impact people for the kingdom when we're willing to do that? So my challenge to you today is this. When you find an obstacle, whether it is in serving in a ministry or whether it's just in your journey with Jesus, you can sit back and say, I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. And that might be true. But don't walk away from it. Don't run away from it. God's got a plan. And if you stay strong, God will teach you. God will strengthen you because God will take you to a place I've heard this phrase, and I've said it here a couple of times, and I'm going to repeat it. The old phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle. I don't agree with that. God always gives you more than I can handle. And then he gives me the grace to handle it. So God puts you there and say, I can't. Exactly. And that is where God's grace and God's power is seen through me. That is where the fruits of the Spirit come forth. That's where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are seen when God is the one doing the work. So you say, it's a little scary. Exactly. That's why you get on your face before God and say, God, I'm a little nervous. And in that communication, God will bless you and use you in a way to impact people you never thought you could. That is where God wants you to be. Now, I also finished with this. We didn't spend a lot of time with it, but I like to finish. We talk about the presence of God, the grace of God, the strength of God. But I ask you this question. Do you have a relationship with God? I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not even saying if you've been baptized or joined a church. Well, those are wonderful things. My question to you is, do you understand eternity, heaven and hell, and where you're going to go when you die? The Bible says it's appointed and a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. There is something that comes next. Do you know where you're going to go? And if I were to ask you that, you know why? Well, I, I've had people say, I think I'm going to go to heaven. I think I'll be in the presence of Jesus. And then I ask the question, 
Why do you think that? Because the Bible says, these things have been written to you to believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. God says you can know this. Do you know? I can promise you this. It's not based upon your goodness. It's not based on how much Bible you have. It's not based on whether or not you grew up in church. It's not based on, you say, I can't get it because I've had a horrible life. It's not based on any of that. Salvation is based on the work that Jesus has already done on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are we saved through faith. Not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God's self gift of salvation is to you. You have to accept it, but he's already done the work on the cross. Maybe you'd like to know more about that today. There's a couple ways you can find out. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. You want to come forward, I'll introduce you to someone who will take you out of this building and just explain to you what the Bible says about salvation. No pressure, we're not going to ask for anything, we're just going to explain what the Bible says and you can make a decision from there. You say, Pastor, I need more than that. Then catch me. We'll set up an appointment this week. I'll buy you a coffee, and we'll walk through what the Bible says and answer questions and help you to get an understanding of the differences in religion and what the Bible says to make it as clear and easy as we can. We'd love to be able to do one of those two things. For the rest of us, maybe you're in the middle of an obstacle. Maybe you want someone to pray with you. I'll be available. There's some elders that'll be available. If you'd like to come forward, we'll pray with you, pray over you. Maybe you just want to spend some time alone with God at the altar or in your chair. My challenge to you today is just don't leave thinking, I, I have to deal with this alone. God's given it to you, but he's also given you the Holy Spirit. Ask for strength. And maybe today is, I want to keep moving forward. It's not going to be easy following God, but I want to do it. I don't want to quit so that I can see God work in ways that he can never use me. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege to, to worship you, to serve you. I praise you, Lord, for the truths in these passages. And Lord, sometimes we're just like that first account where all we do is complain about what you, we think you've not done. And in spite of what really we deserve, you bless. Father, in the midst of that, sometimes right after that, it seems like things get worse. And yet, Father, that is you, uh, something you are aware of. And I pray, Lord, that that would not discourage us, that would not hold us back, that would not make us quit, because you have a reason, and you are doing work in our life. I pray for those that might be facing an obstacle that seems overwhelming, or a discouragement that seems to be crushing them, or something that is just flat out unfair. I pray, Father, that you would help them to hear your presence, feel your presence, and hear your voice today. And Lord, be able to come to you and just give it to you. I pray for someone here who is not sure that heaven is their home. They may not even understand everything that has to do with it. And that's perfectly fine. You told us to come to you like a child. And so, Father, may they come. And today, and even if not set up an appointment, give us a chance to be able to share what the Bible says, what you say about heaven, hell, eternity, and salvation. Lord, in these closing moments, would you do a work that we cannot? We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand together with.